Hey investor friends, I'm Michelle Markey and today I've curated advice on how to be a great investor from renowned investor Howard Marks of Oak Tree Capital Management that he told to Katie Koch, the Chief Investment Officer of Public Equity at Goldman Sachs in June. And he talked about the key attributes that you need to have in order to be a great investor and also an unexpected lesson about success that I found really stimulating and interesting to think about. And so if you also want to be a great investor or at least a good investor please be sure to hit that like and subscribe button and also i hope you enjoy howard marx's wisdom in the following in order to be a great investor you have to dare to be great but then around 2015 mm -hmm. I, I i i said to myself you know but everybody dares to be great everybody's willing to be great and but it had it had come into another focus for me so i wrote dare to be great two which i would recommend you read not one and <laughs> and uh, and i I said, in order to be a great investor, you have to dare to be different, as I just explained. You have to be willing to do some things that that are unpopular and by, by definition will look crazy to, to others. You have to dare to be wrong because there's nothing you can do in the goal... I think the goal in investing for professionals is to be above average. It's, it, investing is a funny business. It's really easy to be average. You just buy an index fund. It's really hard to be above average. But if you want to be above average, everything you do in the interest of being above average exposes you to the risk of being below average. You overweight certain stocks. That's potential error. You avoid certain stocks, that's potential error. You go, you diversify abroad versus the U.S., that's potential error. You, you, you buy high beta stocks, low beta stocks, et cetera. You hold some cash. There's nothing you can do in the interest of being above average that does not expose you to the risk of being below average. So if you dare to be different, you have to be willing to be wrong. I want to ask you one follow-up question on that around risk. So, and I actually want to go back to the very first memo you wrote, October 12th, 1990. Mm. And I'm going to just quick recap. I might not get it perfectly right, but there was, you had an observation. There was a Midwest pension fund manager who was in the top couple of percentile. Think. Well, he, was, in, he was in every year for 14 years in a row. He was between the 27th and the 47th percentile measuring from the top. So he was solidly in the second quartile every year for 14 years in a row. Where did he come out for all 14? Fourth percentile. It's crazy math because in most walks of life, if you stick between 27 and 47, your average is probably 37. His average was fourth. So what was the lesson that you, and there's actually like really, yeah, not really any other industry I can think of where you get around median over a long enough time at yeah. the top. Right. So what lesson do you take from well, that? Well, and, and then the, ju the reason I wrote the memo, yeah. what made me write that first memo it was the juxtaposition to some guy in New York who was running an investment management firm that had a horrible year because they were a value firm and they bet heavily on the banks, which did it terribly. And so he comes out and he says, if you want to be in the top 5% of money managers, you have to be willing to be in the bottom five. My reaction was, I like the first guy better. <laughs> I, like, I like the consistently a little above average as the route to performance, yeah. which was the title of the memo, the route yeah. to performance. I don't like this idea of shooting for the top and being willing to hit the bottom. I'm not interested in being in the top 5% in any one year. I'm absolutely unwilling to be in the bottom 5%, and my clients feel exactly the same. Yeah. So why should I do that? We don't swing for the fences. Oak Tree does not swing for the fences. Consistent batting average. And, and what I say is, if you look at the normal distribution read from, from your direction, most people say, I'm going to get here. I'm going to, be, I'm going to get into the upper tail. I'm going to shoot for the upper tail. I'm going to swing for the fences. And I'm going to have these huge winners. Our, our approach is very simple. Cut off the bottom tail. That's what this guy mm -hmm. in the Midwest did. Dave Van Benskoten was his name. Cut off the bottom tail. So that if you cut off the bottom tail and your total experience consists of Fabulous, excellent, very good, good, not so good, so-so, but never terrible. You'll be one of the best, after, not, after, not after one year. Somebody else will swing for the fences and, and hit it exactly right and will be lionized for her performance that one year. 
who can do it for 30 years? And so I learned the importance of skepticism. And the, the, the great thing in life is to learn your lessons inexpensively, mm -hmm. as I did. Mm -hmm. And one thing that might help someone with that is humility, which is something you're right. a big fan of. Yes. And that's a key cornerstone of our investment culture here. Yeah, good. You're also a fan of Peter Bernstein, I believe. Yeah. And I just wanted to read yes. a quote from him. Yes. Humility is an enormously important quality. You can't win without it. Survival in the end is where the winners are by definition. And survival begins with humility. Can you reflect on that a little for us? Oh, well, that's, that's a great quote from Peter. I have a lot of respect for Peter Bernstein. Um, uh, first of all, it, it kind of goes without saying, but it, I'll say it anyway. You can't succeed if you don't survive. Mm -hmm. And one of my favorite adages is, don't forget the man who was six feet tall, who drowned crossing the stream that was five feet deep on average. <laughs> the concept of surviving on average is irrelevant. You have to survive every day, which means really that you have to survive on the bad days. And so that's why I say you have to arrange your affairs, which means your financing yeah. or your capital from your investors, whatever it is, or your portfolio, so that you can survive on the bad days. Mm -hmm. So that's, that's one thing. But humility, it, it's all about humility. Uh, you have to, you know, Dirty Harry uh, said a man has to know his limitations. Uh, Mark Twain said that, that, that when, you're, when you know something for certain, you, you, you can get into big trouble. It's absolutely the truth. And, uh, you know, nothing in our business is certain. And anybody who's certain is, is, is really missing, missing the point. So, and we say something similar to how you say it, which is that we always have to know what we don't know. Yeah. And when you and I had that prep call, we, we competed with each other about how much we knew that we didn't know. But yeah. you won because you've been knowing what you didn't know for longer than yeah. I'm not knowing what I don't know. But, you know, it's, uh, I, I wrote two memos uh, in the middle of 20, in the middle of the pandemic, in uh, probably June of 20, called Uncertainty and Uncertainty 2, mm -hmm. talking about the importance of how uncertain things are, the importance of acknowledging that, especially to yourself. We have to be honest with ourselves. And, uh, and uh, there's something called intellectual humility, mm -hmm. which I think is extremely important. You know what that means, intellectual humility? Very simple. The other person could be right. Mm -hmm. And if you go into a discussion and say with the, with the belief that the other person could be right, you're going to have a much more productive discussion. Do you think, like, just one last question for you on humility, something we've talked about is um, sometimes it's harder to be humble when you're losing, actually. When you're winning, you can just you can be humble and it looks very gracious. But when things are working against you, sometimes it can be more difficult. No, I think it's, uh, what do you I, think? I think it's it's hard for most people to be humble at any time because they're they're they have these defenses that mm -hmm. that require them to overlook their flaws mm -hmm. and their limitations and. Uh, so, you know, uh, look, I think that thing about experience is what you got when you didn't yeah. get what you wanted. Turn that around. What did you get when you got what you wanted? If you look at, at a human endeavor, um, it, I, I believe strongly that uh, success carries within itself the seeds of failure and failure carries the seeds of, of success. Mm -hmm. What do you learn from success? I can do it. I can do it again. It's easy. I can do it in other fields. I can do it with more money. I can do it alone. It was me. It wasn't the team. And these are horrible lessons. So I think that success teaches terrible lessons because it plays to our uh, egos. Ego. Yeah. And, and uh, you know, I think you learn more from from your failures and, and hopefully you learn humility. One last question on this is that how do you balance that the importance of knowing there's incompleteness of knowledge yeah. with the fact that ultimately you have to make some decisions because you're managing people's money? It, it, all these things are about balance. Mm -hmm. If you assume you know nothing, you can't function. <laughs> if you think you know everything, you're going to get in trouble. You have to strike a balance and, and hopefully it's an, it's an appropriate balance. Mm -hmm. Think about confidence. Mm -hmm. If you're an investor, if you don't have confidence, then every time you, you buy something, if it goes down, you're going to sell it because you're afraid it's going to go down more. 
and you're going to be an abject failure. Mm-hmm. You have to have confidence. You have to, if, if, you, if you buy something, it goes down, you have to reass, reassess your thesis, and, and if it's intact, you have to buy more, or you can't be great. Uh, but on the other hand, if you, if you have hubris and you f- feel you can't possibly be wrong, and every time something goes down, you blindly double down, then you're probably going to get into trouble and maybe be asked to leave the industry. Um, so, but, so you have to have this balance, mm-hmm. confidence, but not overconfidence, uh, humility, but not over humility. Mm-hmm. And then w- one, um, question for you just on pushing on this concept of knowing what you don't know. Mm-hmm. So we have a, a lot more data mm-hmm. now by definition mm-hmm. than ever in the history of the world. And on one argument, you could say, then that's going to help us know more things because we can prosecute this data and come to conclusions that we couldn't have otherwise Mm -hmm. done. We can apply AI, machine learning, get new insights. On the other side, something we say on our team sometimes is a T.S. Eliot quote, where is the wisdom that's lost in knowledge? Where is the knowledge lost in information? Right. Where do you fall out on that? Are we smarter? uh, Look, uh, we have more data and we have more tools for mm-hmm. analyzing the data. But uh, my son and his wife and family came to live with us for the first three uh, months of the pandemic, March, April, May of 20. And then um, I wrote, he and I actually, he, he contributed, uh, but I, I wrote a memo in January of 21 called Something of Value about that experience because it was a great value for us to live together at that time. Mm-hmm. And, and uh, but he, he, pointed out something very valuable, which was that, you know, Buffett talks about having bought dollars for 50 cents. And he really did, because nobody else knew what, which end was up, you know? Uh, I would say I bought some dollars for 60 cents. Uh, I, I can't find those anymore. Uh, and, and Andrew made the point that readily available quantitative information about the present can't help you be superior as an investor, or it's not sufficient to be superior. You have to work with that stuff. You have to understand it and process it, but it's not enough because everybody else has it readily available and it's quantitative. So everybody can process it. And it's about the present. So there's no conjecture, no uncertainty, no vagary. So readily available quantitative information about the present cannot hold the secret to being a superior investor. It has to be something else. And what could those things be? Mm -hmm. You have to do a better job of uh, understanding uh, the import of those uh, those data. You have to do a better job of evaluating the qualitative, the quality of the CEO, the quality of the product, the likelihood that the company will be able to follow a a successful product with another successful product. Uh, the quality of the accounting, whatever mm-hmm. it might be. Or you have to be better at understanding the future. So in, I wrote a memo called Investing Without People mm-hmm. in which I talked about what will happen with AI and, and, and so forth and, and machine learning and so forth. And it, it'll profoundly change our business and it'll put the hacks out of business. But I don't think that it will replace the best investors because the best investors are the people. I said in the memo, I don't think that a computer can meet five executives and figure out which one's the next Steve Jobs. I don't think it can look at five business plans and figure out which is the next Amazon. These are subjective judgments about the future, not based on past data. How's the computer going to get the information to make these decisions? Now, what computers do is they handle a lot of data, they handle it fast, they don't make mistakes, uh, they don't make computational mistakes, and they don't make emotional mistakes. So that's a pretty good list. That'll put a lot of people out of business in, in, in the investment business, but it will not, in my opinion, make enable a computer to be the, the, the Warren Buffett of, of its day, shall we say. 